either a Led Zeppelin video or a James Bond film. I think so. Gretzel came along as a little angel, and Wylan just appeared. <laughs> I think you have to have an ego to some extent to be able to get up in front of 20,000 people every night and fool yourself that you're going to entertain them. Temple Pilots in 1990, its members experienced almost immediate full-fledged rock stardom. That included a lot of media attention, much of it harsh. From the beginning, Stone Temple Pilots were thrashed by rock critics for everything from hair color to personal excess to a certain likeness to a certain other band. And in music, Stone Temple Pilots were on tour. They were great the first time I saw them when they were called Pearl Jam. Despite media bashing, STP sold over 8 million records with their first two releases. The contrast between what the press deemed cool and what people wanted to hear was illustrated by the 1994 Rolling Stone Readers Poll. Critics voted Stone Temple Pilots the worst band of the year, while readers gave them best new band honors. Of course it bummed us out, uh, but I think we just eventually just took an attitude like it. You know, we're just going to make music and do what we do. After spending his formative years just outside of Cleveland, Wyland ditched small town life for the thriving punk scene of Southern California. Meanwhile, in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, the DeLeo brothers were bored with the music scene there and each made a separate journey to the West Coast. Wyland and I met at a, uh, a concert in Long Beach, California, and uh, found out actually we were kind of seeing the same girl. There was a band playing one night. Derek was uh, the loudest out of the band. We just heard drums and we said we got to have that guy. And uh, we just couldn't find a guitar player to complete the project. And I always had my bro on my mind. Well, the way I tell it, they were dead till I got there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically enough, um, even though I grew up on the West Coast and, and, and these guys grew up on the East Coast, we all pretty much had the same musical background. And Wylan, he got really into like um, a whole nother other realm of music that you know I didn't really experience much with. And it, the mixtures is as you hear. Mighty Joe Young, as they first called themselves, spent most of their time hustling gigs around their home base of San Diego before venturing up north to play LA's rock landmark, The Whiskey. They were quickly noticed and signed to Atlantic Records on April Fool's Day, 1992. I um, went back to my job and um, I told them I was leaving that I just signed a record deal and they did not take me seriously. They were like, okay, yeah, right, April Fool's, get back to work. I'm like, no, really, man, I'm, I'm out of here. Ready there, Fellini? Let's go. <clears throat> I am smelling like the rose that somebody gave me cause I'm dead and Only a few weeks before the release of its major label debut, Mighty Joe Young, the band, were informed that a blues singer in Chicago named Mighty Joe Young owned the rights to the name. It was just the worst. It was the worst. Library, we looked at everything. Uh, Scott and I were sitting around, we were just talking about stickers when we were kids, like on our, you know, banana seat bicycles and skateboards. We were just talking how cool the SCP sticker was. And he was like, we should do something with those, with those uh, initials. And I just blurted out, Stereo Temple Pirates. And we called Robert all excited. And Robert goes, I don't, I don't think I'm so into pirates. And he goes, waiting the pilots. We're like, yeah, that's cool. And we called Steve, our manager. He's like, well, what do you think of Stone? It just came out, Stone Temple Pilots. We kind of, Went with it.
Now I can remember being a little kid and you opened up the album and you looked at every song and you listened to every song and the whole album had a vibe and that's what we were trying to create with Core is make an album that just flowed from top to bottom with, it, with a vibe. Core began creeping up the charts with its first single, Sex Type Thing, which secured heavy radio play and accusations of glorifying date rape. It was just uh, something really simple. Um, Wylan put himself in the perspective of the idiot type person, for lack of a better term, who uh, thinks like that and, and um, looks at women in that aspect. And, uh, you know, you know the, the lyrics. Dress up a little bit, you know, for all you macho type guys that might have misunderstood this song. It might anger people at first who don't really understand what the song's about or what, what you know where we come from on certain um, issues like that. But uh, I think that in general the idea has come about. Did you really write plush in a hot tub with Eric? Lyrics. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so we're just sitting there in the hot tub throwing ideas back and forth. It was just kind of, kind of intimate between friends. Is there anything wrong with two men being naked in a jacuzzi together? Not those two men. Writing songs about dogs and love. Determined to prove themselves even further, the band hit the road, leaping from 500-seat clubs to 5,000-capacity venues as Megadeth's opener. Along the way, Plush was everywhere. Even an impromptu acoustic set inundated the airwaves. Oh, when the dogs you find her, got time, time to wait for tomorrow. The label wanted to put the acoustic version on some form of EP, which we weren't really keen on because that's one song off of an album. There's there's uh, 11 other songs. We don't want this record to be thought of uh, you know, as uh, the plush album. I don't really owe anybody anything. I think I owe myself something uh, musically. And that's just to be honest about my own emotions. And, and because songs are derivative of, of human emotion, I mean, just hope in a perfect world that that's uh, what eventually will define you. By the summer of 93, Stone Temple Pilots were making the rock and roll rounds and gearing up to tour. They made the head-turning decision not to go on the road with Aerosmith, but to take part in an alternative package deal dubbed the Barbecue Mitzvah Tour. This is really only our fourth tour, the only time we really had a chance to actually show people what we're about, and we just thought it was a better idea to hit more intimate places. Normally a concert you walk away spending probably fifty dollars a person or something. It's more money than people can really afford, so we want to just, you know, keep it low. For three for seeing three bands, it's 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 a good good show for fifteen dollars. SCP's concern with affordable concert going and alternative ticket methods continues through today, as well as their concern of treating fans to the type of rock spectacles they were weaned on. We just kind of wanted to just give something people could leave and really talk about it, you know? Like the KISS thing, um, you just got to find ways to keep yourself entertained. You know, whether it's uh, running out with a jock strap on or whatever, you know what I mean? Just, just to keep yourself entertained. But the fun of touring began to wane. An incident involving an alleged shoe-throwing fan and Wyland and Robert's angry physical response earned the boys a lawsuit. Meanwhile, their disillusionment with the music industry grew as touring took its toll on them personally. We should have quit touring after that point. Basically, it felt like all we were doing is making other people money and, and, and with the th that we had to deal with in some of the, the media 
in the last you know year really began making supporting that album uh, a job and, and not fun anymore ironically in the midst of an antagonistic relationship with the press STP were on top by early 1994 the group had collected numerous awards including a Grammy, two American Music Awards, one Billboard Award, and the Video Music Award for Best New Artist. And the winner is... Stone Temple Pilots. Mostly, say thank you to the people that have paid more attention to the music than they have to the media, because that's uh, ultimately what matters the most. So, um, to those people, thanks for the space, man. STP did impress fans and critics alike with their unplugged interpretations. One of the show's highlights was Big Empty, a song that later catapulted the Crow soundtrack to the top of the charts. Driving faster in my car Falling farther from just what we are Since we've been um, rehearsing <clears throat> for the show, it kind of brings you back to that uh, initial feeling that you had that you know it really originally like inspired you uh, to to feel and to write. Still feeling the emotional repercussions of the past year, the band took a well-needed break from each other before finally deciding to reconvene the songwriting process. Artistically, we needed to do it. The new album was probably the only thing that saved us from breaking up, which is unfortunate that things got to that point, but I think certain things were created out of that, uh, that tension that probably wouldn't have happened uh, if, it, if we all would have been getting along, you know, all peachy and everything. Next guests uh, currently have the number one album in the country. Congratulations. Very, very impressive. And ladies and gentlemen, do us a big favor. Say hello to Stone Temple Pilots. Kids! I thought it was a valid growth from core, and there was definitely different emotions thrown in um, that we were all feeling. Lyrically speaking, the words are from a much more personal perspective it's because of experience, and it means a lot more to me because of that. Definitely an artistic level, it's more experimental because I feel that rather than feeling this pressure to make something as acceptable as core was, I think we actually felt more freedom to explore different sounds. Interstate Love Song, the second single from Purple, was huge, spending a record-breaking 15 weeks at the top of the album rock charts. Stone Temple Pilots were now a headlining act, except when they took the opportunity to open for the Rolling Stones. It was like, oh, we're headlining our, our big tour. And then we went over to do those two shows and we realized how, uh, how small our tour really was compared to that one. In May of 1995, at the height of the band's success, Wyland became part of a rock and roll cliche. Less than 24 hours after his arrest for possession of cocaine and heroin in Pasadena, California, Stone Temple pilot singer Scott Weiland phoned up LA radio station KROQ and introduced his friend Courtney Love, who read a note in which Weiland called himself a man who has failed and apologized to his wife, his family, his friends, his bandmates, and his fans for having what he called the disease of drug addiction. What prompted you to call into K-Rock with an apology? Did you really feel um, like you had to talk about it? If I didn't say something first, I felt that a lot of people would be saying things for me or about me. My dream to make music for a living is my lifelong dream and I've done it. But the things that came along with it, I didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't prepared for a lot of those things. I have to remind myself to remain humble in the face of music all the time or else 
that gift can be taken away, you know. Whose mom is that? Jamming on the guitars. <laughs> Dina, Dina and I. That guitar was probably on about 11. By the end of 1995, Stone Temple Pilots managed to have another hit song with their take of Led Zeppelin's Dancing Days from the Encomium Tribute album. And Scott Weiland experimented with a side band, the Magnificent Bastards, who were featured on the soundtrack of Tank Girl. But as far as STP was concerned, the primary issue was putting aside their personal differences and Weiland's ongoing legal battle and getting back together as a music-making unit. I think the main part that's satisfying about the writing is when a song, either by us three, is presented to Scott, um, his way of putting what he has to the song mm -hmm. is really fulfilling. I think that the, uh, the stress of it's changed. The first album, it was kind of overwhelming. All of a sudden we're on a big label and uh, I think it forces you to second guess certain things more than we would now. You know, we kind of just follow our instincts a little bit more than we have in the past. After several failed attempts in 95 to begin recording new material, the band finally did follow their instincts and headed to the Santa Inez Mountains late in the year. They sequestered themselves on a hundred acre ranch that doubled as their home and recording studio. There they wrote, reconnected, and relearned how to be Stone Temple Pilots. We hadn't played together in a year. I mean, we, the band had almost broken up. It was like starting over. It worked out great, you know, and when we all got together, it was, it was a pretty good environment because we got to be like, you know, kids again, playing around all the time and making music, which is what we love. got to utilize the whole house. You know, everywhere the cables would reach, we utilized from the bathroom to cedar closets to the front lawn to the uh, living room. When you said the front lawn, did they, did they actually put you on the front lawn? Oh, you yeah. We tried about four different rooms, uh, and we just, it, it wasn't sounding right, you know? It sounded too big, and we wanted it to be a little drier and tighter. I wanted to be by the pool, because it was a nice sunset, <laughs> and the ca cables wouldn't reach out there, so we ended up, yeah, doing it the front lawn. Their unique recording techniques can be traced back to producer Brendan O'Brien, the man behind their last two records, as well as works for Neil Young, Matthew Sweet, and Pearl Jam. He's just truly amazing. He has impeccable ears, he's a great guitar player, and uh, when we're doing something, it's like we don't even have to talk. What I'm trying to convey onto tape, he already hears it without me even uh, explaining it, and it just, it just happens, you know? the vibe of this record? It's more raw, I would say, than that, only because it's less produced than, say, the last one we really got into experimenting with a lot of things, and then this one is a little more straight ahead. If somebody played that for me and said, who's this band, I wouldn't have said Stone Temple Pilots. <laughs> That's good. Interesting well, instruments. Yeah. It just goes back to, uh, I think we all have a, an appreciation for so many kinds of music. Mm -hmm. Any song on that record that um, you have as a favorite? Yeah, I think Adhesive is probably... My favorite, uh -huh. really, especially what he did lyrically on that one. It's really amazing. What about you, Scott? Um, Seven Cage Tigers. I'll put a vote for that one, too. Sounds like something he would have done maybe uh, ten years ago when he first started. Yeah, it reminds me. STP's visual image is often as strong as their music, but when the time came to shoot the first video for Tiny Music, they decided to tone things down 
and get back to the basics. So we've done some sagas. Yeah, a couple epics. Yeah. Why go lo-fi? We've never done something where it's like, uh, okay, music, and we're just playing. So uh -huh. we wanted to make it as uh, basic as we could get. stripped down both sound and visuals for Tiny Music, and while music is foremost in the group's mind, its members must still contend with past ghosts, present critics, and future decisions. Despite what's behind them and the unknown ahead, Stone Temple pilots seem ready to get on with their musical lives. It's taken such a long time, not the recording process, but the waiting around and trying to get started on it. I think it's just, it's just a nice fact knowing that we have another great album. A lot of people just view the musicians as like, okay, he's the bass player, he's the drummer. Well, it's not that, that way. We all contribute. It's, it's really just a beautiful thing when the four of us do this.